Hey, what's up, guys? Toogie here. I'm back again with another episode of my heart for Wales franchise mode series right here on NHL 18. You already know this. I should say it's very tired. Very tired. Toogie here today. It's weird to be like, oh, I'm a very tired Toogie. It's, I'm, a, I'm a very tired person today. But we're still here. And in today's episode, we take on the Anaheim Ducks in the conference final. We are the defending Stanley Cup champions. We're halfway home to another. Eight wins down, eight to go. The road continues against Anaheim in this episode. Of course, the lineup will pretty much remain the same until we absolutely have to change it as we've continued to pretty much be, you know, we've changed some things up where it's been necessary. But until Yerky Petrolinen starts to fail us, we're pretty much good no matter what. I absolutely just jinxed us for this episode, so that's good. Let's go ahead and take a look at the opponent. We're playing the Ducks in the conference final, and this is their team. Some familiar names, of course. We took a look at their lineup at the end of the last episode as we bra uh, bra as we basically as we basically had to or basically say what you want it's an interesting team actually did we look at their team we looked at their team right i can't remember if we did i could have sworn we looked at their team i don't remember but regardless they have kosa rank off yeah we definitely looked at their team they have kosa rank off to brosky gibson and goal it's going to be a challenge. Am I too tired and potentially too delirious to be recording right now? Absolutely, which is why it makes all the sense in the world to record and get through this series. The Ducks are 8-3 so far through this postseason run. We're at an 8-5 record, and of course, we'll be keeping an eye out on the Connecticut Whale. They have a 9-2 record, and they're up two games to zero on the Lehigh Valley Phantoms. Let's go, shall we? Game... One, we're at home in Hartford. Let's do this. A Western Conference final between a team in Anaheim and a team in Hartford. For those that don't know, I've mentioned this a couple of times, but remember, we started this series before the division realignment feature was added in, so we had no choice but to be in the Central. And as far as playoff series go, it creates some interesting matchups. Anyway, first period of Game 1. And I suppose I could have waited a little bit longer. Eunice Brodeen gets the lone goal of the period, despite the fact that we outshot them 14-7. to Not ideal, but we still have a long way to go. Second period. All right, we, we don't have that much longer to go. And now we're down by two. Sam Steele gets the goal just before the end of the period. We're outshooting them 28-16, to but we're down 2-0 to on the scoreboard. Do we have a third period comeback in us? Of course, we want to take advantage of home ice. For the Ducks, oh my god. For the Ducks, the strategy is to win at least one game on the road. Right now, we're looking at the chance of them potentially winning two because they've already accomplished that goal in game one. Reed Boucher made it three. John Gibson. With a 40-save shutout in Game 1. We outshot them 40-25 to 25 and walk away. Losers, as losers. A 3-0 defeat on home ice. We mentioned not changing anything about the lines. Perhaps we should. Maybe we'll just take another look. Not that I want to panic this early. But it might be worth taking a look here and seeing if there's anything we can change up. I believe the Connecticut Whale won again. They're now 10-2 and two in this postseason. Toronto took game one over the Bruins. So let's see. What are we dealing with here? Top line remains the same, even though Sprong is struggling a little bit. Phil Quick continues to struggle. The only option would be to... Oh, man. The only option would be to drop... Phil Quick, all the way to the fourth line. That would be the only option. Unless we drop Jones, Watson, and Radish down to the fourth line, but I don't really want to do that. Obviously, we wouldn't be getting the most out of having Phil Quick if we have to drop him. But I'm going to do what I have to do for this game. We're bumping up Spike Rowe 
And we're going to see what he's capable of playing with Dirksen and Patrick on the second line. Defensively, we're okay for the most part. Tuzzolino and Harkins, it's not perfect. But we'll leave it the way it is. Phil Quick gets dropped down to the fourth line. I know we only lost one game and it's insane to do so. But let's just try it. See how it goes. If it fails, we'll put him back on the second line for game three. Meantime, Spike Rowe deserves this opportunity, so let's give him a shot. First period of game two. And <laughs> Nick Ritchie, Reed Boucher, Sam Steele. Wow. Three goals in under four minutes. 14 shots, three goals for the Ducks. We had one goal from Andrew Chuck. We're down 3-1 to one at the end of the opening 20 minutes. I talked about Petrolina playing well. We might be looking at playing Malcolm Subban in Game 3. Second period. Kreider makes it 4. Alright, we're down 4-1 as we head into the third. I may have jinxed Yerky Petrolina. Leidecker gets a goal back, thankfully. It's 4-2. to two. Power play chance for the Ducks. We're able to kill that off. We have a power play chance of our own. If we had scored on that, I would have a little bit of confidence, but with five minutes to go, we are facing a two games to zero deficit. The Ducks win both games on the road. John Gibson, two very solid performances. Subban ended up playing, finished the game with a 956 save percentage. So no doubt about it. Malcolm Subban will get the next start. Petroline and struggles against the Ducks on home ice. And that puts us into a fairly bad situation. The Connecticut Whale did indeed win the first three games. The Phantoms were able to stay alive after the win in Game 4. What an awful start to this episode for us. But we'll see if we can find a bit of redemption here. I'm not really sure if Spike Rowe accomplished much. Let's go ahead and make those changes. We'll put Nolan Patrick back with Lydeker. And McKinnon and Malcolm Subban will get the opportunity. Petra Lyon's save percentage has dropped by 15.015, which is still considerable over a two-game stretch. And now we have to head out west. We're in Anaheim for games three and four. Let's see if we can get back into this series. I'd like to think that we could. But maybe the Ducks are the perfect matchup for us, considering Reed Boucher, of all people, is simply destroying us at this point in time. First period of game three is thankfully scoreless. I'll take it, although we were out, or we did outshoot them 12 to seven. So I consider that a victory for the Ducks to have not given up a goal. Second period, still scoreless, 21 shots to 19, a strong period for the Ducks. I consider us a little bit thankful that it's still tied. This is huge. Third period, scoreless. Win. We're right back in the series. Lose. And we're facing a three games to zero deficit that might just be impossible to overcome. Power play chance for the Ducks. A five on three is killed off. We have a quick power play chance of our own that we can't score on. Anaheim has another chance that passes them by. Two minutes to go. Are we going to overtime? Yes, we are. A goaltending duel between Malcolm Subban and John Gibson. 35 shots to 24 in our favor. Still scoreless. Overtime. Can we get the win? Or are we facing, again, a near insurmountable, a nearly insurmountable deficit? Long power play for the Ducks. Sam Steele gets the winner. And the Anaheim Ducks have a three games to zero lead. I was going to say none, but technically it's three games to zero. John Gibson, 40 save shutout. A great performance from Malcolm Subban. We just have no answer for Gibson right now. It's ridiculous. We have th two goals. Two goals over three games. They're outscoring us eight to two. Over the first three games, the Connecticut Whale are moving on. 
which is lovely. They're going after a Calder Cup. And that might be the only kind of positive note of this episode. We'll roll with Malcolm Subban again. But I, I don't see how we come back from this. Toronto's up 2-1 to one on Boston. So there won't be a sweep in that series. Let's go ahead and put Malcolm Subban back in. Well, here's the thing, right? Subban did extremely well. Petra Line, it's like, do you go with the goalie who probably gives you the best chance to win or the goalie who's playing better right now? I think we got to go with Subban. How do we change this team up, though? What do we do? Because that second line isn't necessarily gelling. The top line's doing okay. The second line, though, isn't exactly getting it done. You know what? I think desperate times call for desperate measures. Let's try something different. Leidecker, Quick, McKinnon, Dirksen, even though he's not a great center, Nolan Patrick, I mean, Daniel Sprong would technically be the better center option. I could go with Spike Rowan and either Andrew Chuck as the center. You know, we'll just go with Nolan. Dirksen, Patrick, Sprong, and the bottom six will stay the same. So a fairly drastic change to the top six, just out of necessity. Tuzolino is still struggling a little bit, so you know what? I'm going to drop him down. We're going to have Harkins, Larson, Ribeiro, Tuzolino. Malcolm Subban is between the pipes. Our power play has been incredibly disappointing. Let's take Phil Quick off of that top line, number one. It seems like an awful idea. And you know what? For the most part, that's actually pretty much good to go. We just had to make that one change. We're underperforming, and John Gibson is a brick wall. That's what it comes down to. We face a three games to zero deficit as defending Stanley Cup champions. Let's see if it ends here. Does our reign end here? It's not over until the final horn. Although, of course, guys like Kosarenkov and DeBrusque will gain a little bit of revenge here. Although, we did win the cup without them, so I'm not going to be too upset. First period of game four, and finally we're able to get a somewhat early goal. Nathan McKinnon, exactly six minutes in. We outshot them 13-8, to eight, and we have the one nothing lead. There's still a long way to go, though, so let's not get too cocky. Second period... Okay, we can have a little bit of confidence now. Seth Griffith made it one all, only for Austin Watson, Warren Dirksen, and then Nathan McKinnon again, his second goal of the game. He makes it 4-1. to one. At the end of the second period, 26 shots to 16. It took a while, but the Whalers have finally gotten to John Gibson. It took an elimination game to do so. Again, your goal scorers, Watson, Dirksen, and McKinnon has two. Third period... Hopefully we can avoid disaster here and live to see another day in Game 5 back on home ice. Jake DeBrusque, yeah, Jake DeBrusque scores. I'm, I'm probably jinxing myself here. Okay, maybe not. Phil Quick. We get another goal from the first line. Under five minutes to go. And that is all she wrote. The Hartford Whalers do, in fact, live to see another day. 5-2 victory in Game 4. That's one win down. Only three to go, no problem, right? Nathan McKinnon with a three-point night, two-point night for Phil Quick and Gary Harkins. So we tried that different setup for a top line, and it worked out relatively well. Now, why Phil Quick lost morale for underperforming when he just had his best game of the postseason, I have no idea, but that's a, you know, that's a thing. And what's also a thing is the Connecticut Whale playing for the Calder Cup. They'll be taking on the Stockton Heat in the final. We'll, of course, keep an eye out on that series. There's a good chance we could really be keeping an eye out on that series because at any moment, the season for the Whalers could end. We need to quickly, though, put Malcolm Subban back in. He has been tremendous. That's why we kept him around as the backup. 934 save percentage for Subban at this point. It's very similar, I'd say, to the Crawford-Darling situation from a few years ago with Chicago. Toronto's up 3-1 on Boston. 
Let's see if we can keep this series going one game at a time. So all we can focus on is one game at a time. Game five back in Hartford. Yet again, the goal is simple. Keep our season alive. First period is ideal in a way. Lucas Leidecker scores with 35 seconds to go. I would have liked about six more goals, but yet again, we get to John Gibson early. Despite being outshot 11-8, we walk away with a victory at the end of the first 20 minutes. That's the, that's that's a one battle. You haven't won the war known as Game 5. I almost said Game 6. Game 5. I'm getting ahead of myself. EA, I'm sorry. I apologize. It was an honest mistake. Don't jinx me. <laughs> I'm just kidding, guys. There's no such thing. EA totally doesn't listen through your Xbox. They don't. Not at all. Second period. Andrew Chuck gets the insurance goal. 23 shots to 17 in Anaheim's favor, in Dana's favor. But we're up to nothing. Come on. Third period. Oh, God. Reed Boucher. Since when is Reed Boucher a goal scorer to this extent? This is ridiculous. Thankfully, we were able to kill off that last power play opportunity for Anaheim. Halfway through the third, power play chance of our own. Can we please get a goal? Thank you, Nolan Patrick. It's like an 18 minute power play. That will do it. The Whalers have battled back. We win games four and five. And all of a sudden, we might have a series on our hands. I need to double check what was up with the ungodly amount of power play time there. It was a, a double minor for high sticking on Eunice Brodeen. Are you sure it's only a double minor? It felt like we had 18 minutes of power play time there, not literally. But it seemed like longer than four minutes. Malcolm Subban, your first star, your first style of the game. 36 saves. Bruce Andrzejczyk and Lucas Leidecker with a goal apiece. And again, this series is now only 3-2 in Anaheim's favor. Not to mention, I think game one went well for the Connecticut Whale. Let's take a look, shall we? What was the final score? 2 nothing shutout for the Connecticut Whale in Game 1. Not too bad. And again, we need to go put Malcolm Subban in. We got to roll with the hot hand, uh, game. Don't tell me you froze. Don't tell me this game froze. You got to be kidding me. Come on now. Not like this. Not <laughs> like this. Oh my god. It totally froze. It totally froze. Now, thankfully, somehow, some way, the game auto-saved, which typically it doesn't. I thought we were going to lose all of our progress. We did not. So I've never been so happy to be facing elimination still. <laughs> we're still down 3-2 to two in this series. Let's go ahead and sim to game six yet again. I am beyond relieved that we didn't lose our progress. Very rare, very rare occasion, for me at least, to have the game freeze on me. It's been very, I mean, the game's been great for me. There's no other way to put it. I really haven't had crashing issues. I haven't had freezing issues. Even when the game first came out, a lot of other people are having trouble so I guess I can't complain too much. After all, the autosave did kick in and save us here. Hopefully, by restarting the game, we have a little bit better luck. Then again, we did win the then again, we did win the past two games. I don't know what to expect for game six. We're back in Anaheim. Let's see if the season continues or if the Whalers are destined for a nice round of golf in a couple of days. First period of game six. And as it stands, we're going golfing. Ivan Kosarenkov, an old face. We outshot them 12 to eight, but we're down by that one goal. Second period is scoreless, 24 shots to 18. John Gibson's on a roll. Third period, the season comes down to this. We need a comeback to happen or it is all over. Power play chance for the Ducks. It's like 10 minutes long. At this point, we're able to kill that off. That was a bit of an exaggeration. 
but not by much. Nine minutes to go. Earth to the Whalers. We need a goal here. Three minutes left, and John Gibson shuts out the Whalers. And the dream of a repeat ends. John Gibson was just too much for us to solve. Malcolm Subban was spectacular for us. There's no other way to put it. But John Gibson and the Anaheim defense, you got to give them credit as well. But John Gibson is able to get the job done. I expect an Anaheim-Toronto final. How disappointing. How disappointing. I guess rather than looking at the stats, we'll do that all at the end. Our focus shifts to the Connecticut Whale. We can't sit here and mope about it. We got to move on. We got to look forward. And the future is potentially bright. The future is extremely bright for the Connecticut Whale. We are one win away. A three games to zero series lead. It's game four on home ice. First period is scoreless. 15 shots to seven in our favor. Second period is not scoreless. Goal apiece. Teakin off. And Makonen with 16 seconds to go. We're going up against Scott Darling. Third period. Can we win the cup on home ice? If we lose this game, we're going right back to the calendar sim. If we win this game, then hey, we have a Calder Cup to celebrate. Yet another for the trophy case. To continue the long lineage of successful AHL teams in the history of my franchise mode series. And we're going... To overtime. Unfortunately, I am too damn tired and I don't have the voice right now to commentate over the overtime, so we'll hope for the best here with the sim, and there you have it. Oberg starts the year down in the AHL, gets called up, gets sent back down, and he gets the winner. The cup clinching goal in overtime of game four. And you're the year, your Connecticut Whale, the Connecticut Whale, are the Calder Cup champions. 30 saves for Lawrence Jones. Add another trophy to the trophy case. 15 wins, 3 losses. What a postseason run. What an effort from the Whale. And it is indeed an Anaheim-Toronto final. We'll keep an eye out on that series as they continue. The Ducks are up two games to zero. I suppose I would rather lose to the eventual cup winner. Makes sense to, you know, soften the blow a little bit. And I suppose, you know, if I had to choose, oh, who would I want to have win the cup in real life? It would probably be Anaheim over Toronto. Anaheim's up three to nothing. John Gibson's going to win the Conn Smythe. <laughs> I don't think there's any debate over that. Gibson's going to win the Conn Smythe. There it is. There it is. At least we didn't get swept, right? Although it very well could have happened. The Anaheim Ducks sweep the Maple Leafs in the uh, Stanley Cup Final. I want to say the Conference Final. And in the Calder Cup Final, the Connecticut Whale beat the Stockton Heat. So, unfortunately, it's a little bit anticlimactic compared to some of our other wins. Even if it is a Calder Cup. I know some people don't get why I'm so happy about that. But it's a good sign that the AHL team is in a very good spot. We will focus on the Whalers, though, to begin. So we don't have to end on a disappointing note. Much like this team did as Lydeker and McKinnon. Played relatively well. Some of our goal scoring and point getting defensemen weren't able to continue that stretch. Phil Quick did much better once we put him on the top line, but that was a very disappointing postseason run from him. Eric Tuzolino, perhaps the most disappointing player. You look at what he did in the regular season with 37 points, 21 goals, 2 points in 14 games. That is awful, really. There's no other way to put it. Henrik Oberg... Like I said, he was on this team. We sent him down out of desperation. It worked out. As he ends up being the hero for the Connecticut Whale. 
Yerky Petra Lion with 11 games and uh, 923. 10 appearances for Subban, a 944. The goaltending overall was decent. The offense just couldn't overcome John Gibson, who was an absolute monster. Down in the AHL, Lawrence Jones was the man with an ungodly 956 save percentage, 15 1 and to a 1.1 goals against average. What a beast of a goaltender he might be, at least at the AHL level. Henrik Oberg actually led the AHL team in points, 15 points in 16 games. Tony Andrews, who also got sent down, did incredibly well. Phil Crosby with 12 points in 16 games. You have Dave Stoll, Prestberg. So many of these players that will be battling for a bottom six spot next season. Uh, maybe even Stutzel for the third pairing it's another it's another trophy for the trophy case though like i mentioned in the history of our franchise mode sims let's go ahead and take a look at the awards as we bring this season to a close the cup defense that's now the second straight year that we know of at least that the defending stanley cup champion it, I mean, at least made it relatively far. Of course, the Islanders lost in the cup final. We lost in the conference final. So it, it's nice to, you know, have still been competitive as opposed to like, oh, okay, you won the cup. Now you're terrible and you're not even going to make the postseason. Art Ross goes to John Tavares yet again. He continues to be a monster. He also won the heart for the second straight year. Morgan Riley wins the Norris. Tarasenko, the Lady Bing. Yerky Petrolinen, technically a rookie. It was his first full season. He wins the Calder. He, he pulled a Matt Murray. <laughs> he wins the Stanley Cup. And then is up for a Calder debate. Although, of course, in real life, Matt Murray somehow didn't get Calder votes last season, which is stupid. But Yerky Petrolein, your Calder winner, and there was no doubt. John Gibson wins the Conn Smythe. I need to go look at his final save percentage. Petrolein and won the Vesna. Oh, man. He had such a good season, too. Such a good season. To be honest, though, it wouldn't have mattered if we started him against Anaheim. Our offense just wasn't there, and Subban did incredibly well. But the con Smythe... So already in two seasons, Petrolinen has a Stanley Cup, a Calder, a Vezina, and... Well, yeah, he has a Stanley Cup, a Calder, a con Smythe, and a Vezina trophy. That is ridiculous. He also won the Jennings. His trophy case is pretty damn full at this point. McDavid wins the Selkie, Tavares wins the Ted Lindsay, and the Rocket Richard down in the AHL. Do we have any familiar names? I don't believe we do. Just that Lautner guy who is killing it as a defenseman. Lawrence Jones wins the Conn Smythe, or the equivalent of the Conn Smythe, the Jack A. Butterfield Trophy. Which, I'm not surprised, given what his save percentage was. Spencer Watson takes home an award, as does Scott Darling. But unfortunately for him, he doesn't get a Calder Cup for his trophy case. So guys, that will conclude a very inconsistent episode. Obviously happy for the success of the AHL team. Makes me feel all that much more confident about the prospect factory that we are trying to develop as I mentioned, I believe the bottom six will change quite a bit heading into next season. Perhaps there will be even more changes as well. We'll find out starting in the next episode with the draft. Again, I hope you did enjoy. If you did, you know how to support the video and the channel if you decide to do so. Beyond, of course, just watching the video in the first place, which again, I do appreciate your support as always. Links are in the description to my Twitter and Twitch. Give me a follow on both of those platforms if you have not already to keep up to date with all the happenings and to, uh, you know, check out a live stream. If you haven't been able to do so, I typically stream later in the day, uh, Eastern time, of course, in the U.S. But if you can check out a stream and you haven't already, feel free to do so. Typically play some NHL, typically play some Madden, might be playing some other games. Who knows? Who knows? You never quite know. There's never really a set plan as far as what I'm going to play. So it's always, at least for me, it's typically always a good time. Again, I thank you for watching. I'm tired. I'm going to go to bed. Catch you guys later.